Hey, welcome everybody. We start with a talk. It's about developing a theory of democratic schools. And a few disclaimers in the beginning. I will not be able to present a theory. It's important for you to know that uh, I will not present a theory because I don't have one. <laughs> but I would like to develop a theory and that's because this talk is called Developing a Theory of Democratic Schools. So that you are not disappointed afterwards. <laughs> Who am I? I'm a co-founder and staff member of a democratic school in Germany, in Berlin. Netzwerkschule and it has been founded in 2008. And I'm also a council member of UDEC, assigned to the Circle Research and Theory. I studied physics and mathematics and a bit of economics and education. I'm not a scholar, I'm not an academic, I don't work at a university. I have no PhD, maybe it's also interesting to know. And. I have been involved in these conferences since 2003. The first IDEC I went to was in Albany, in New York, in the USA. And the first UDEC European version of this conference was 2008 in Leipzig, Germany. Two weeks ago, I stumbled accidentally uh, on an invitation of my old faculty. My old faculty is the Faculty of Physics in Berlin at the Technical University and they were having a faculty day where they gather all together and where they look back on the last academic year, what has happened, what have they achieved, a bit like what we are doing with UDEC maybe. A professor was presenting all the achievements of the scientific groups and this one is for example from a guy with the name Knorr and he's presenting what has happened in his work group at the last year. You can't see the headline because uh, it's covered. Uh, I tried to catch the headline and, and I couldn't. I sat in the row there and I couldn't move enough to catch the headline. Maybe we can take a guess. What do you think? What is the headline? The experiment. In no, 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 in. Oh, no. In theory. In theory, we trust. <laughs> I like this headline so much. And um, who is saying such such a sentence? In theory, we trust. It's probably a physicist or some geek. Probably not someone who is active in starting up democratic schools. This would not be his mantra, I think because it's much more practical. If you want to start a democratic school, it's much more practical. You have to solve practical problems. They would say probably in practice we trust educators and Samahilians. But I think there's a connection between these both sentences. A theory can be very practical. There's a saying that nothing is as practical as a good theory. And I would like to see that sometimes we try to solve problems we face in our democratic schools, uh, that we try to solve them theoretically. And some of these problems can be solved theoretically. And that's what I like, and I would uh, maybe even develop a whole theory on its own. Uh, that could be very useful. Uh, what are the objectives of a theory in general, regardless if it's a theory of democratic schools, but in general what are the objectives of a theory? To understand something, to understand something which is already there. For example, we, want to, we might want to understand why are there stars and why are there planets orbiting the stars, what happened there, and we try to understand it and we do it by constructing a theory to construct. Um, sometimes it's not so much about understanding, uh, but uh, we want to construct something, and in order to construct something, we have to understand something. That's the uh, objectives of engineers. If an engineer wants to build a bridge, 
he or she needs some theory to do so, so that he or she can be sure this bridge is not collapsing. So sometimes we need a theory to construct something. This is an important one. Sometimes we want to do something and people around us don't believe that this is going to work. I think all of us, we know the situation. And then we try to convince them that this is a good idea and that we should be allowed to do it. So we argue and we use arguments, reasoning, and we can use theory to try to justify what we want to do or what we are doing. This is a double-edged sword, I think, because it can turn easily into justifying what you are doing and not really looking what really is happening. It can easily turn into I use a strong word because I don't know another word right now. English is not my first language, so I use a strong word, maybe too strong. It can turn into propaganda. If you just are looking for those evidence, those arguments which support your own case, and you don't look to those arguments which uh, might uh, contradict your case, you are risking to fall into propaganda. It's a bit strong, this word, I know. To enlighten, there's a theory group, international theory group, just a bunch of people who meet every one or two months. We talk also about what is it about a theory. Sometimes we think that something is true and we should be cautious and sometimes we have to shed light into the dark to understand that what we thought is true in fact isn't. In our theory group we called it debunking myth. Get rid of myth. I think there are some myths within our community and it's a good idea to investigate them from time to time. To predict, that's the most difficult one if we want to build a theory of democratic schools. I'm not sure if we can predict anything, but if you think of a theory in general, theories often can predict something. Especially in physics, I've studied physics, people are predicting events long before they are happening. And they know they will happen. They predict, for example, some new elementary particle long before they are discovered, actually. It can be quite strong. A theory can be quite strong to predict, actually, events. In social science, I'm not sure. So, and for me, an objective of a theory is also to have fun. <laughs> for me, it's fun. Uh, there are uh, quite a lot of books about uh, democratic schools. We have books from Summerhill, from A.S. Neal and from other people. We have books from Daniel Greenberg and other people from the Sudbury Valley School. We have books from Jakob Hecht and also a lot of other books. The aim of these books, sometimes um, it's only telling some stories. And sometimes there's an article, for example, in a book, there's a chapter where there's some theoretical reasoning. You find it, you find some theoretical reasoning. These theoretical reasonings are mostly there to justify something. To justify that the school is working like they are operating it and why it's working, so they are looking for arguments and they are good arguments, sometimes they are very valid arguments to justify what they are doing. And that is not a criticism. When I uh, think of Daniel Greenberg, for example, from the Stockwell Valley School, he does it a lot, I think. But it's understandable that he does it. Together with other guys, he founded the Stockwell Valley School in 1968. And over decades, I imagine they had to defend what they were doing. They were under constant pressure, I imagine, like Summerhill also was under pressure, was under threat. So they have to defend what they are doing and it's understandable that they justify what they are doing and sometimes they use theoretical reasoning to do so. But if we want to develop a theory, a theory should be self-reflexive. 
that is characterized by a critical reference to its own presuppositions, assumptions, objects, and attitudes. I think this is important. If we are to develop a theory that we question our own assumptions, that we are brave enough to put our own ideas to the test, even if we are risking that some argument won't hold anymore. All this is kind of a framework. I, what I'm presenting to you is a framework how we could, if we want to, develop such a theory. And one part of the framework is to think what requirements should a theory of democratic schools fulfill. One of the requirements, I think, is enable rational debate and help solve problems. In our schools and also maybe in our movements, we face problems. And a theory can help to solve some of these problems and can help to enable rational debate that we don't only fall into accusations and arguing, but that we try to solve problems in a rational way. A uh, second requirement is connect with related areas of social practice. We don't live just in our schools, there's a society around us and other uh, social interactions are happening in the society and I think a theory should be connected to these other related areas of social practice. And uh, connect with neighboring academic fields, I think that's the uh, easiest one, I think it's very natural that a theory of democratic schools should be connected with other academic fields like, for example, education in general, or psychology, learning theories, all this kind of stuff. When I was working on this talk, something new came to my mind. Maybe a theory should also explain the differences and foster diversity. So maybe it's not three requirements, but four. So it's not set in stone. Those requirements. Which difference? Pardon? Which difference? Explain difference between the schools, for example. We have very different schools. Why are they different? What is the difference? I have the impression that these both are closely connected, and I have an example exactly for these both. My first example, and I have one example for this, connect with related areas of social practice, and I have not an example, but an illustration for connect with neighboring academic fields. So we start with the first example. Some words why I came to think of a theory. These ideas bring out uh, real-world problems. In our school, when we were operating our school, we were facing some problems. So what are you doing if you have an argument, for example, with some other staff member? How do you solve it? And one idea to solve it is to talk to each other maybe on a personal level and maybe get some help from outside, like counseling, that somebody from outside comes and helps the team to solve personal issues, personal problems. And I think it's very important. I'm glad that we had these possibilities to talk to each other with the help from someone from outside. But some problems are not personal. People are fighting with each other maybe, but I had the impression it's not something between the people. It's not that they don't get along at all, or that they don't like each other at all. It's something else. It's more on another level. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. What's behind this conflict? And now, here is one. Uh, I read it to you. I remember a little argument with my colleague from Summerhill. At our school, we had once a staff member who was student at Summerhill, and afterwards, he also worked as a house parent in Summerhill and then he, he studied in England and at some point he returned to Berlin because he was originally from Berlin and he found out that there's a democratic school, my school, our school, Netzwerkschule and he applied and so we had a staff member from Summerhill. 
and once I remember a little argument with this colleague, I had doubted that the school meeting could take a particular decision. The suggestion was, the motion was, to limit the right of only some of the school members to use the computers. I was of the opinion that the school meeting was thereby illegally interfering with fundamental rights and, in particular, disregarding the principle of equality. The school meeting here comes up against the limit of what it is allowed to decide. It is not allowed to decide everything. I was of the opinion we can't just infringe of the right of some people to use a computer. That's not possible because it's a basic right for everyone to use what he or she wants. That's the first argument. The second argument was if we limit only from some people the right to use a computer, uh, we are violating the principle of equality. That was my reason. Uh, the colleague from Summerhill was outraged by the statement. He was convinced that the school meeting could decide everything. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a democratic school. This is a strong statement and I was impressed because he was from Summerhill and I thought, whoa. Um, I have experienced it happening several times that people were talking to each other, maybe on such a conference, and they were listening to each other, what are you doing at your school, and then at some point, oh, that's not democratic. <laughs> it's quite common, I think, this comment. So, this is a potential conflict. And now, what are we going to do with this conflict? As I said, we could do supervision and counseling and everything else. And I had the impression that's not the problem here. The problem is something else. And I will very quickly show you the solution which I found, a theoretical solution which I believe to have found to this problem. And it's very quick. The solution is not to decide who is right, but to analyze the underlying concepts of democracy. We have here this magenta or violet ellipse, meaning this is a people and this is a parliament. It's just a symbol. And we can have the same people, not the same, but we can have a people and a parliament the other way around. What does it mean? The purple is who is the sovereign. Oh, that's difficult for me. I practice this word. <laughs> In German, it would be der Souverän. In English, it's the sovereign. <laughs> I hope all native English speakers understood. <laughs> so, uh, there are two very different concepts how in a democracy you organize the sovereign. Uh, on the one hand, you have the idea that the people is a sovereign. People is sovereign. In German, it would be Volkssouveränität. People's sovereignty. And that means that the people is electing the parliament. Parliament is taking decisions, but parliament isn't the sovereign. Das Parlament ist nicht souverän. Das Volk ist souverän. The people is sovereign. So, Parliament can't just take any decision because Parliament is not sovereign. It's the people who are sovereign. That's the case in Germany. But we have another concept which is the other way around. That you have a people and the people have the right to vote. So they vote who is going to be in the Parliament. And in the moment the parliament has been voted on and is in office, the parliament is sovereign. The parliament can decide whatever it wants to decide. And this concept is called parliamentary sovereignty. Parlamentssouveränität. This is Volkssouveränität in German. Parlamentssouveränität. And this is the major difference between, guess which countries? <laughs> the people from Germany who are here, what do you think? What kind of sovereignty we have in Germany? In Germany? Yeah, in Germany. That's what you just said. 
Would it just have a full sovereignty? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because we don't have a parliament sovereignty in Germany. We have this one. What do you think? What is uh, the UK? <laughs> <laughs> the UK is the example of a parliamentary sovereignty. The most common known example of a parliamentary sovereignty is the UK. So there we have it. We have Germany, Netzwerkschule, and we have UK, Summerhill. And this is the concept which we both had in our minds without knowing it. I didn't know it at that time. I didn't know this difference. And he also didn't know it at the time. But we were about to have an argument about it, without knowing. And I think sometimes it's very helpful to let personal stuff aside and try to analyze what's behind it, what's behind the conflict. And I think that's what was behind it. Uh, oh, what do we have here? I was too quick, I wanted to show this first. <laughs> In the UK, what do we have in the UK? Yes? Well, it's the Queen of England, and yes. one reason why they have this system. Pardon? It's uh, the historic reason why uh, the, in the UK it's the right uh, version is because the Parliament was standing uh, against the Queen or against yeah, the yeah. and trying to have the same position as the Queen. Yeah, yeah. In the UK, we have the Queen. And if you go very far, if you really want to know who is the sovereign in the UK, you would have to say it's the Queen in Parliament. The Queen in Parliament is a sovereign. Don't ask me what that means, but that's the case. <laughs> Most people from the UK don't know, I think. But um, you, you can see it in some rituals. For example, the Queen comes in the beginning of each legislature. The Queen comes into the Parliament and there's some rituals. The Queen reads the program of the Parliament. So they have these rituals and they point to the fact that, in fact, in the UK, the sovereign is organized this way. We have a Parliament which has two chambers and the Queen. So, who? is the Queen of Summer <laughs> We have the Queen of Summer Hill. turned out to be so similar to what they have in the UK that I began to ask myself, wow, how much are we influenced by the democratic traditions of our own countries? I think we are more influenced than we know. What do you think? Who is who is Prince Charles of Summerhill? <laughs> okay, enough of that. Um, I wrote an article about it. If you want to know it better, uh, more into the details, then you can just uh, download this article and read it. Okay. So now we are here just to remind you where we are. We have seen an example and it hopefully enables rational debate and hopefully helps solve this problem and it also explains the differences between our schools and hopefully it supports diversity okay next example is connect with related areas of social practice i put there six areas of social practice and of course there's um, a relationship between pedagogy and politics. We all know it. I don't have to give you any examples, I think. <laughs> of course, there are relationships between pedagogy and ethics. We could talk about it. I don't want to do it right now. I just want to point out that there are some relations. There's also a relationship between ethics and politics. And in fact, between every social practice, between every two social practices, there is a relationship, and that looks like this. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's not from me, it's from a professor who is called Benner, from one of his books. And if 
we want to connect with related areas of social practice, we would probably not study this one. Because we are in this field in pedagogy. The only relationships which are relevant to us are these. All the relationships between pedagogy and the other social practices. Okay? And I will give you one example between pedagogy and economy. And uh, it's an example which you all know, I think. Let's look at a common phenomenon. Parents enrolled their child in a democratic school because they are convinced of the philosophy. After a while, they start to worry because they believe that their child is not learning enough. They put their child under pressure and reproach staff members for not making enough offers to their child. The school should motivate the children more and create an engaging learning environment. Uh, who of you knows this phenomenon? <laughs> quite a few, quite a few know this phenomenon. So we have a phenomenon, we have a problem. It might cause a problem to our schools, so what are we going to do with it? We could invite parents and talk to them and maybe again with outside help, who knows, maybe that's helpful. But again, I think there's something much, much deeper behind it. And again, I will present you the solution without the way how to come to the solution. And again, I will provide you with a link so that you can follow the reasoning behind it, okay? So, democratic schools cannot solve this problem on their own. They cannot. Sometimes it works because parents grow over their fears and everything works out. It's fine. And it's fine if staff members and parents talk to each other. If staff members maybe try to encourage the parents it's all fine, I'm not against it. But it's not a solution. It's not a solution for solving this problem once and for all. It's only a solution in the moment with this parent, okay? The solution lies in investigating the relationship between money, democracy, work and economy. It turns out that money does not belong to the realm of economy alone. It belongs at least as much to the realm of democracy. And this is what we don't understand very well and what we don't implement at the moment. The money is a tool to guarantee a right. Uh, the right to live in dignity. Uh, that's a strange notion of money. Would you agree? Yeah. It's a strange notion. Yeah. We don't experience it like this. That's a problem. We would have to work on this problem to solve what the problem is with the parents in the school. We would have to solve this problem. And that's not to be solved by democratic schools alone. This is a video which was recorded of a talk and I explained it in depth. So, if you are curious now what this notion of money is all about, you can watch this talk. Now we have the last circle here, connect with neighboring academic fields. So, what do we have? We have, if you want to develop a theory of democratic schools, we have already a lot of academic findings, studies, expertise. For example, in the field of democratic education. One example would be uh, John Dewey. Uh, this is a German version. Uh, John Dewey, Education and Democracy. He wrote about democratic education, so we can rely on it, we can cite him if we want to. Uh, but we also have not only the field of democratic education, but also the general field of education. And I think we should look at this field too. There's not only democratic education, and I respect that there's a broader notion of education, which is not necessarily democratic, and we shouldn't ignore it. 
and one book is this uh, from Dietrich Benner, which I cited, and it's amazing, and I want to know more about it. But he's not into democratic education. I think maybe he doesn't even know. But he has written stuff which is interesting, I think. We have, of course, theories of democracy. And if we want to develop a theory of democratic schools, we should know them. These are some books of theories of democracy. And what's most interesting for me, there is a field, an academic field, theory of schools, at least in Germany. In Germany, there are not many, but there are some books, these ones all about theory of school and I think it's interesting maybe we should look at these and know what they are writing about and if they are able to write a theory of school we are able to write a theory of democratic schools I think. <laughs> okay uh, these are the neighboring academic fields not only these which I mentioned here but also other academic fields of course theory of learning psychology sociology uh, are neighboring academic fields and uh, we should be if we want to develop a theory of democratic schools we should somehow have contact with these academic fields that's for the examples of these requirements of a theory of democratic schools now we are coming to an end there are some fields i'd like to explore i'd like to explore how do traditions of democracy influence our schools this is the first example about this parliamentary sovereignty and people's sovereignty and how does it influence our schools i think it's interesting uh, i'm very much interested in cultural differences and in what john harris laughlin talks about who knows john laughlin nobody knows john laughlin Sam, he's a guy, he is living in Indianapolis in the USA and he grew up in a black neighborhood. I'm not sure if I'm using the correct words, forgive me. He lived and was raised in a black community. He had lots of friends and close contacts with people who were of color and later he studied education and he fell in love with the democratic schools and at some point he got interested in why aren't there african-american who are founding democratic schools why are there no founders of democratic schools who are african-american and he began to study those issues and cultural differences and he found out something which i find interesting and i would love to go deeper in this the influence of other fields of social practice on education this circle i think it's very interesting and there's one other topic which i think is very relevant for us in our movement of democratic schools i hear a lot talk about community community seems to be something which is seen as something good uh, if we live in a close community that's something which is great and society mm, society is not so much loved because of politics and corruption i don't know what that's something which might be interesting to study because it might be a kind of a myth sometimes i am a bit skeptical if you are too much celebrating community because it has some potential Backdraws. Drawbacks. <laughs> Thank you. And one guy who wrote about this is this one, Helmut Plessner. He wrote this book, Grenzen der Gemeinschaft, in the 20s. And he was concerned about the movement of these communities, which were in the 20s very popular. And he foresaw that those communities can become corrupted and can become something very dangerous. I would like to end this presentation with a short video clip. I hope it works. I don't know if the internet connection is good enough, but we will try, okay?
This is uh, from another talk from Christiana Mushu. She's from Greece. <laughs> no, I, I honestly think that uh, it's always very interesting when we try to think, to conceptualize, to challenge what we know. I think it is important to never rest. Theory is not something boring. Theory is restless. Theory is questioning, is researching, is thinking the unthinkable. So thank you all for being here, for participating. Thank you for your questions. And well, theory is good. <laughs> Don't get bored. <laughs>